Today's scripture reading comes from Romans chapter 1, verses 1 through 6. Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the holy scriptures, concerning his son who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. This is the word of God. Amen. Hey, how many college students or students, maybe grad school students, college students, grad students do we have in here? Ooh, okay, mostly. Wow, that's quite a bit. That's quite a bit. You know, school's beginning. How do you guys feel? <laughs> it's like mostly students in here, you know? Uh, it, it's the beginning of a new school year. And, you know, if you guys didn't know, uh, to, today is also a, a beginning of a new cell season. Uh, so that's why we're doing name tags. You know, we're expecting new students to come, and we're going to meet new people um, and have a new cell season and things like that. And so that's why there's going to be food outside after, after service, and there's going to be a uh, place to sign up for cell. And so I want to encourage everyone uh, to get a name tag um, and just to get to know a few people today. So this is the start of something new. Um, you know, and, and sometimes I think when we start something new, things can be a little bit stressful, right, when you have to meet new people. Uh, when you have to uh, start a new career, uh, start uh, a new school year. Uh, I've been talking to my uh, daughters about uh, their anticipation of the new school year, especially my junior high kids. I don't know, I don't know. Junior, I feel like junior high in this country is not so academically stressful. Like, I never see my junior high kids study. You know what I mean? And they're like, they're getting good grades. I'm like, what is happening? I don't know what's going on with them. The high school kids, a little different. They are stressed. They are stressed. Like, they're talking about AP classes and, you know, like how many they're going to take. And I don't know. And they're, they're, they look stressed, you know, about this new year. And as we're talking about it, and one of my girls, she said something like, I'm not ready to be adulting. She said that. And I was like, adulting? That's a verb? <laughs> I, I didn't know that was a verb. Uh, apparently, there's a, there's a certain way we use that word. So I looked it up. <laughs> and I found this definition of adulting in, on the internet. And uh, see what you think about it. Adulting is assumption of tasks, responsibilities, and behaviors traditionally associated with normal grown-up life, along with the implication Okay, this is interesting. Along with the implication that the individual in question, the person saying it, does not particularly identify as an adult, and that acting as one does not come naturally. You guys agree with this definition? Have you guys ever used that word in that way? I'm not ready to be adulting. It's, a, it's an interesting thing, you know, because... I think there's so many things that have, uh, are, are different, uh, you know, but when I was younger, I didn't think anything about becoming an adult. Because what is that, 18? What do you get to do when you turn 18? Vote. Right? That's the, or, and die for your country. <laughs> so you, I got to be, you know, drafted for the military in case of war, and um, I get to vote. That wasn't exciting to me. <laughs> So I didn't really think, 16 was different. It was like, oh, I get to drive, you know, and 21 is different for other reasons. But, you know, <laughs> but 18 was not something, parents didn't speak English. And so it, like, there was just a natural assumption in my mind that my life was not going to be the same as theirs. Do you, do you know what I mean? There's just a, when your parents don't speak English, they're speaking Spanish or they're speaking something else, whatever language they're speaking, you, and you grow up speaking English, you just have this natural assumption that my life will be different. But I think when you guys speak the same language, it's a little, maybe it's a little more pressure. <laughs> maybe it's like, oh my gosh, my life could be like theirs. And you're like, 
I don't want that, <laughs> right? Like, I, I'm not sure if I want a life like that. So there's this, um, I think the pressure that kind of goes along with that. Um, but, you know, let's look at some things that adults may be expected to do. Now, I wanted to put this first because we're, we're at church, amen? <laughs> you know, a lot of times these lists, like last is like, oh, if, and if you're Christian, this is my first thing. <laughs> if you're Christian, you're walking with God. And, and I think that's a reasonable expectation for us. Number two, be on time, right? That's a thing, you know, apparently that you're supposed to do. Get your work done. <laughs> you know, there's a thing. I, you know, I believe that this is a reasonable expectation, right, I, I guess, that adults are supposed to have. Pay your bills. Now, now I, the list, as it goes on, I put it in a way that I feel like it gets more challenging. <laughs> okay? Gets more challenging as, as the list goes on. Pay your bills. Keep your stuff in order. Don't live in a disaster area, right? I, seems like a reasonable, um, you know, expectation. Have friends. Now, this can be, start getting hard. <laughs> this is start getting hard. No, I'm, I'm being 100% serious. You know, like social interactions, friendship. This is not, this is way harder than cleaning your room. How many agree with that? Yeah, friendship is like, this is like ninja adult. This is where like ninja adult starts happening. You know, it's like, a, you know, because so, social interaction sometimes, it's like mysterious. You're not sure why people like you and you're not sure why people don't. And it's like, a mis so there's, there's things like that. So, but having friends, I think we need friends and we all know that we need friends. Sleep at night. <laughs> Sleep at night. I know it sounds funny, but this is very easy not to do. You guys feel me? You guys know that, right? Especially for students. Do you know what I mean? Because one late night watching Netflix, just once, right? And then you're, you, all of a sudden you see the sun come up, and then you go to your 8 o'clock class because you think, yeah, I, I just got to do it, I got to be responsible. And then you come back and you sleep all day. And then vampire life just begins, right? And then all of a sudden, you just keep on sleeping during the day, being awake at night. That's not good for your health. That's not good for your life. If you have a job, you're fired. <laughs> and so, so this is something that adults shouldn't do. Eat healthy sometimes. <laughs> you know, exercise sometimes. <laughs> You know, I don't want to say eat healthy all the time because nobody does. Exercise all the time, nobody does. You know, most, and the thing is, the, the, the thing that's ironic about this list is a lot of adults have trouble with this, right? A lot of adults, a lot of adults have trouble with these things. But it seems like we know that there is a certain expectation. Um... There's a certain expectation, I guess, as we go, get older to live a certain way. And that's probably because our parents are telling us, you know, people who are older, older brothers and sisters, I don't know, there's people just kind of harping on us that you got to do this. Look at how old you are now. You're an adult. How many, how many of your parents have told you that? You're an adult now. You got to do this. You got to do that, you know? And because my daughter used the word adult, adulting, I feel like I can't say that to her anymore. You know, I gotta be like, you know, just, uh, you know, let's just all try to be responsible. <laughs> you know, I gotta put it that way now. But these kind of things um, in today's society, it's interesting because there's a certain subset of people who are like rejecting this. It's like, forget. It. And they use the word adulting as like, forget it. I'm not gonna live that life, right? There's people who are like, I'm not gonna live that way, the way that my parents lived. That's boring. That's for them, and I'm going to live a different way. Um, there's a rejection of kind of normal standards, I guess, just common standards uh, in the world. And, and there's this, a certain subset of people who are like, no, forget it. And you know why? It's because there is a certain change 
in the way that we think about life. You know, conforming to standards or conforming to societal norms now is looked at as oppression, right? It's like, no way. It's just a very negative implication to be an adult, negative implication to conform yourself to a certain standard of living for a certain age. We're just like, what? Forget it. We don't want that. Um, why? Because it has become much more individualistic. Even in America, which is like the land of freedom and individualism, it's becoming even more so. The term expressive individualism, this is interesting, was coined by the American scholar Robert Bella, who defined it as follows. Expressive individualism holds that each person has a unique core of feeling and intuition, a unique core of feeling and intuition that should unfold or be expressed if individuality is to be realized. There's a truth, right? This is what it means in, in the modern parlance, this is what it means to live an authentic life. You do you. People have been saying that ever since I was younger, but now it's like, no, you really do you. <laughs> it's like, really, just whatever you are. And so this is what it means to um, live an authentic life. You take it to the extreme. This is what it means to, have you ever heard this? Live your truth, right? Um, maybe you even said it, right? This is my truth. Let's be people who live my truth or our truth. Each person has a unique core of feeling and intuition, and we need to express that. And you know, and I think this sounds really good, right? Um, living out your truth, it sounds so freeing, right? Forget what anybody else says. It sounds so free. Uh, it sounds so brave, right? You're like the brave frontier of your own life, and you're going you, you're gonna to do what you feel like is your truth. But if you look at it another way, it's also pretty self-centered, right? It's like, it's all about what I think, what I believe. Um, you're your own standard, and that can be dangerous. Because the question is, how do you know you're right? You know, and, and at church, you know, people may say, how do you know the Bible's right? Good comeback, right? <laughs> I don't know, the Bible's right. But you know, like, it's, it's, it's kind of shaky because the Bible's like thousands of years of history, tradition, culture, like wisdom through thousands of years. You're just like, you know, your thousand hours of YouTube, right? <laughs> you are just like whatever your experience of your life, one life, whatever your experience is, and you're, you're living that out. The Bible is a little bit different. It's, it's like thousands of years of collective wisdom and, and life experience kind of in, in the scriptures. And so, you know, it's kind of crazy to compare your own wisdom to, to that. But, you know, obviously there's a chance of being wrong. Um, but the, the thing is, um, doing what you want, many times it doesn't end well. Uh, for your health, for your relationships, um, for your finances. Um, you know, and, and so sometimes it doesn't end well. Now, another reason, I think, why people talk about this adulting, that's one way. That's like a rebellion. I'm going to be myself. But then there's another way where people talk about it where they're like, I can't do that. Like, I feel like I can't be responsible for myself. You know, and some people are, are more that direction. Um, it's kind of, and, and that's worrisome to me. And I feel like if you're of that kind of mindset, I can't do that. I don't know how to do that. I can't do that. That's an admission of defeat. Um, you know, and I, and I, but I also want to tell everyone that no one's here to judge, right? Like, all of us, make mistakes. I've made so many mistakes in my life, like 
all that list, I've broken that whole list of adulting. Like I've been late once when I was in college. It's crazy. I can't believe I did it, but I'll, let me just tell you, and please don't do what I did. I led worship. I was a worship leader, right? I was, you know, just like Alexis. And, and my roommate was the drummer. And one Sunday, one Saturday night, we stayed up late. And one Sunday morning, the, like, we saw the clock, and it was like 12 o'clock. We missed service. And I was the praise leader. Oh, my. That was the most scary phone call I've had to make in my life. I had to call the pastor. And he's like, oh, you guys. And I was like, oh, shoot. I thought he was going to, like, kill me. You know, I've done wrong things. I, I, when I was 25, I had so much credit card debt. I, I was so financially irresponsible. I mean, okay, all these things I've done in my life. So just because I'm preaching here, don't be like, oh, he's judging me. You know what? I understand. I've done it all. Unhealthy relationships. I've done it. I've done it. <laughs> and so <laughs> today, I'm not saying, no, listen to me. Um, but what I'm saying is maybe the scriptures... You know what? That attitude of, I can't. The attitude is, I just don't think I can. That's worrisome to me. I don't think that's the attitude that the Lord wants us to have today. Um, there's times, definitely, when we feel like we can't. And maybe some of us, when we're thinking about our new career our new school, our new even cell season, I don't know. Like, you know, maybe you're new here. Um, there may be like a apprehension and worry like, I can't. And that, that thought comes up. But today I want you to know that the Lord is your help. You know, I've been there to that dark place. The Lord is your help. In Psalm 121, verse 2, it says, my help comes from the Lord who has made heaven and earth. It's weird, actually. To me, it's weird that the scriptures describe God as our help. But he knows that we need it. We need that help. You know, when we feel like the world is going to end, you know, I, I'll tell you, once I was applying for grad school, and then I was serving at church, and I'll tell you, one weekend, this is what happened to me, one weekend, like, one of the youth kids backed into my car. He just backed into the car, and he's like, oh, shoot, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry, and it was a little dent, and I was like, ah, forget it, <laughs> you know? And then I remember driving home from, from uh, that same weekend, driving home, and I fell asleep right in front of my house while driving, and I totaled my car. In, I could see my house. I totaled my car about 100 feet from home. And then when I got home, I opened the mailbox, and I got a rejection letter for grad school. <laughs> and then I remember that day, I laid down, okay? I laid down in my bed, and I, I kid you not, I literally felt like I might die. Now, I mean, like, like this weird fear that maybe God is trying to kill me. <laughs> it was weird fear. It came into my mind, and I just slept. I just slept. Why am I sharing this? <laughs> I'm sharing this because... I know how bad it can be. And I know how dark and how hopeless you can feel. But what I'm saying is the scriptures, God, he's actually our help. He's our help. And the gospel is telling us that our life, 
our life is to be lived even though there's dark times, even though it can be tough like that. Gospel, it has something to say about our life, about your life today and my life today. And what is that? Number one, the gospel is about a new life. Turn to the person next to you and say, you need a new life. <laughs> That's not an insult. It's not an insult. We all need this new life. We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead, by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. The gospel brings us a new life. And it's characterized right here, just, it says, just as. Okay? What does that mean? It's making a comparison. Just as Christ was raised from the dead. What is it saying? It's comparing your life to Jesus' life. And so the gospel life is a new life, and it's described by what? A resurrection. It's characterized by a renewing of life. It's characterized by change. And what is death like? Death is powerless. Death is passive, you know? When you look at a dead body, doesn't move, doesn't change, stays the same. The only way a dead body will move or change is if somebody else does it. It has no power on its own. But it's talking about life. Life is different. Life moves. Life changes. You know, there's some cockroaches in my house that have so much life in them. <laughs> they scare me. I've never seen such big, I've lived in China, I've never seen so many big, I've never seen so big cockroaches in my life. But when the lights go on in the middle, at night they come out, lights turn on, they scatter underneath my car. I'm like, ah! There's life, it moves. Cockroaches find a way. They find a way to survive. That is life. That is life. And I don't want to compare us to them, but I'm just saying there's, there's something about life that is polar opposite to death. Um, there's an activity. There's a powerfulness with life. There's an activity or an activeness about life. And that's supposed to characterize us, you and me, amen? It's supposed to characterize us because that's the walking in newness of life. Just as Jesus rose from the dead, he went from death to life, you, me, go from death to life. Be active. Change. From glory to glory, the Bible says, change. Dead things never change. Things that are alive change all the time. And so that's what the scripture is telling us. And how does this change work? Okay. The gospel is about two kingdoms. Okay, it's about two kingdoms. And you know, let, let, let's see what that is. In Romans chapter 6. Verse 12, it says, Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and yourself, your members as instruments of righteousness to God. For sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Okay. So, it says here, there's two kingdoms here. I don't know if you see that clearly. 
there's two ways to live here. There's two lifestyles here. There's two um, kingdoms kind of incorporated into this passage. One is sin and the law, and the other is righteousness and grace. And what is sin and the law? Where does it lead? We know that it leads to death. It leads to chaos, you know? And chaos, it's, that's what the devil brings. Uh, chaos, you know, when you look at creation even, God created order out of what? The darkness. And the, the whole Hebrew, it's, it's actually chaos. So even the act of creating, okay, is bringing chaos into order. And so the results of sin and the law, it's death. Death is a life of chaos, a life without order. Uh, that's why I think, I believe, you know, cleaning your room, putting order into your life, it's actually something that's godly. Also, you know, if you, those creatives in here, if you're creative, being creative is godly. It's, it's something that shows the mark of God in your life. Um, and his creation is bringing order out of chaos. But if you let sin reign, what can happen? Um, things can get dark. Uh, I had um, a former youth student. Uh, he, during youth, when he was in youth group, he was just like so on fire for God. And then uh, one day he came to visit me we're in the same city, and, um, you know, he just visited, and we had, we had uh, like, lunch together, and he's, like, kind of broke my heart. He's, like, you know, you know, I know, like, when I was in high school, I was all on fire for God, but that's, you know, when I was young. I'm just not like that anymore. You know, I, that's not for me anymore. You know, this is, like, something from the past. Um, and then, you know, so he didn't come to church, and he just kind of left and, and did his own thing. And then, like, years later, I... I got in contact with him, um, and he said that after he, you know, the next few years, he was going to school, he was going to work, um, he got into a, you know, he was just doing partying, doing whatever, he got into a motorcycle accident, and, you know, he was in rehab, he got on painkillers, and he said, he started just taking painkillers, like, he got addicted to painkillers. He said he would take 20 at a time every day, 20 at a time. And he said his life completely just became about that. Nothing else. Just finding ways to find the painkillers, getting the prescriptions, doing whatever he could to get and keep up the painkillers. Like his job, everything was just falling apart. And then he lost his job and he was just... So he went home. And his mom, who is a very devout Christian, basically rehabbed him. Just, he said, he'll never forget it. One day, his mom laid her hand on him and prayed for him. And it was like, something happened. Something happened to him that day. It just, his life completely changed. And, you know, now... You know, he, he's all better. But that's not the point of my story. <laughs> he's married and a kid and all this kind of stuff. But, uh, and and he's, he's, he's much better now, and he's, he came back to the Lord because of that. But before that, the, the darkness, you know, the sin, the brokenness, it's when you follow sin, your life can get dark. It can go down that path. Um, and sometimes this isn't like drugs, you know. And sometimes it's like even just common things like laziness, porn, drinking, food addictions, what, whatever it is. And then lack of performance can also lead to depression and, and just like a continuous cycle going back to that. Um, that's the cycle of sin. That's the cycle of darkness. That's the cycle of chaos. And I'm sure some of us in this room are or have experienced that. 
But what is righteousness and grace? So Paul is setting these things in opposition and he's saying, let God rule in your life. That's what it means for the kingdom to come. Let his words be the standard. And it says here, it says, present in verse 13, but present, that word, very key, present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead. This present yourself is a call to loyalty, fellowship, and intimacy. You know, there's two kingdoms here. And basically the word of God is saying, you can't be loyal to both. You can't do both. It's like being married to two people. You can't do that. It's like having an extra girlfriend on the side or extra boyfriend on the side. You can't do that. That's called, in, in English, okay, whether you're a Christian or not, that's called, what, when you have an extra girlfriend or boyfriend? It's called cheating, right? I don't know what else you guys said in here, but <laughs> I don't know. Maybe there's a new word. I don't know. But <laughs> it's called cheating. Why is it called cheating? It's because that's something you're not supposed to do, whether you're Christian or not. Everyone's like, that's cheating. Why? Because you're not supposed to have two. Because there's an understanding that that relationship is a relationship of loyalty. That's what it's saying here. It's saying you can't have two. You can't be playing both sides. And he's calling you to loyalty. Present yourselves to God. Get out of that darkness. Get out of that sin. Get out of that life. And present yourself to God. And be loyal to him. So much of faith. And when you look from Genesis to Revelation, you know, so much of faith is actually about fighting for loyalty to God. So much of it is that. And so this scripture is saying, get out of that kingdom. You can't be in both. You know, that's what Jesus says. You cannot have uh, worship two gods. You can't worship one and worship the other. You can't both uh, worship God and mammon. You, you can't have both. So he's calling us to righteousness. And it's calling us to fellowship and intimacy, living in the presence of God. You know, many people, uh, especially when they become Christian, you know, they say, oh, you know, I, Pastor, I have such a hard time praying. I have a hard time reading the word. I have a hard time praying. You know, there's a Puritan saying, I, I, I want to encourage everyone, like, pray until, pray and what does it say? Um, pray until you can pray. Pray until you can pray. Pray until you have prayed. Pray until you can pray. Pray until you have prayed. It's actually a matter of breaking through. It's kind of like saying, you know, I, I just can't run. You know, like exercise running. Do you know there's a, there's a brother at our church? He's an ultra marathoner. Do you know what that is? There's a group of people in the world that thinks 26 miles is not enough. <laughs> they just think 26 miles is too short. He ran 100 miles the other day. 100 miles. You know how that, that's like, it's hard to finish in a day. That's like four marathons <laughs> put together, right? And you know, you know what's crazy? He tore his, so I, I played basketball with him like six months ago. He tore his Achilles. And then I talked to him last week. Yeah, I just finished a 100-mile marathon, ultra marathon. I'm like, didn't you just tear your Achilles? He goes, yeah, but it's okay. <laughs> it's like, and then he's telling me, because, you know, I'm, I'm, I've been running like, you know, like a mile, <laughs> like a mile or two <laughs> a day, right? So I've been doing that. And I was like, I hate it. I hate, I hate running. He goes, you know what? You just got to keep on going. Because, you know, there's a, there's a time where you just, you'll love it. 
I know you don't believe it. <laughs> like, yeah, whatever. No, it's interesting, but there is this breakthrough. But I think prayer is the same thing. I think our prayer life, there is a point where you break through. And I, I think a lot of people, they don't emphasize that enough. Our intimacy with God, there's a point you break through in intimacy, but you have to do it. There has to be, I pray until I can pray. Because it's a breakthrough thing. It's not a I don't know how to thing. You know? It's not a I don't know how to thing. It's a I'm not breaking through thing. So pray until you can. And pray until you have. And that's, I, I, I think, will help us in our intimacy uh, with the Lord. Because it takes time. But he's calling us into that. He's saying, present yourself to God. Be loyal to him. Have fellowship with him. Be intimate with him. Sometimes we just have to break through the flesh. We have to die. And you know, Paul says, you have to kill that thing. He says, you have to kill the flesh. Or else it's going to kill you. He says that. Kill that flesh or else it will kill you. And so there is a call to this um, um, new life and a new life of allegiance to him. And what this means is that you're under grace. And what does it mean when you are uh, aligning yourself to God and this new life of righteousness and grace? Under grace, you have forgiveness for sins. And, and we, we know that if, if we've been Christian for a while, but... It says in Ephesians 1, 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. The forgiveness of our sins according to the riches of his grace. Amen? That means no matter what sin you have committed in the past, there is forgiveness available today. Praise the Lord. You have forgiveness available today. Thank you, John. Thank you for that clap. You have forgiveness available today, no matter what you have done. And that's forgiveness for sin. But we also have freedom from sin. Forgiveness for sin, but also freedom from sin. We're not bound to sin. What does that mean? Don't believe the lie that you can't change. That breaks my heart. When I see that in my kids, when they're like, I can't do it. I can't change. It breaks my heart when I see it in people. The belief that I cannot change. You know what you're saying about yourself? You're saying, I'm dead already. <laughs> this is dead man walking. <laughs> There's nothing that can change in me. Only dead people say that because only dead things don't change the word of God saying is we're not dead anymore we're alive we can change and to believe that you cannot is a lie from hell itself and God is saying no the gospel life is a life of change that's what he's given you and me today. So we have freedom from sin, freedom from that lie, from freedom from bondage, and we have forgiveness for sin. No matter how dark you think that sin was, Jesus said, today you have the opportunity to be forgiven for that. And number two, the gospel is about a new king. It says in Romans chapter one, this is what we read Today, Paul, a bondservant of Christ Jesus, called as an apostle set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, who was born of a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles for his name's sake among whom you also are the called of Christ Jesus. 
So let's first talk about the word gospel. The gospel. Euangelion. This is actually a very, you know, there used to be a, okay, I, I guess that Bible's still around. Have you ever heard of the Good News Bible? Have you ever heard of that? that I don't know why. That, in the 80s, that was just like the thing. And everyone read the Good News Bible. Maybe that was a new Bible at the time. But that word good news sounds very uh, common, I think, to us. Like, oh, what is the gospel? It's good news. Hallelujah. It's actually a pretty specific word, especially in the times of Rome. It was often used in the Roman Empire okay, to announce significant news. It was like a news bulletin word for their government, such as reports of military victories, royal decrees, or other important announcements. Um, this is actually a very political word back in the day. Uh, you know, people don't like mixing uh, politics with, with religion, but that's what the gospel is, actually. In, during that time, it was an affront to say that there is a king, and this is all, this is the promise of a new king. He promised beforehand who? The descendant of David. He's the son of God. Son of God was the language for Caesar. That was the language. So the gospel itself, even the word gospel, I mean, in a sense, for us, it's like the, um, what is that? The State of the Union address. Listen, everybody, we have a State of the Union address, and then there goes the gospel. That term was specific used by the government. And so, what are we saying here? It, it, it's saying that this is about a new king. And this, is, this was actually an affront to the people. It was counter-cultural. There's a reason why thousands of Christians were martyred during this time. Because the world wasn't having it. And this counter-cultural aspect of the faith continues today. We all want to be friends and we want to play nice. We understand that. But we, I think us Christians, we have to understand from the beginning, this was offensive to people in the past. And they decided to kill Christians for it. That's our history. And to expect that because we're so educated now that people will just be nice, that's foolish. The countercultural aspect of Christianity was there from the beginning, and it's here today, and it's most likely going to always be there. This was a promise, okay, in verse 2 of a new king. Um, that was the son of David, that is also the son of God. Um, this was an announcement of the kingdom. And as we said, it was a call to allegiance. And how do we know that? Because it says in verse 5, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith among all the Gentiles. All the Gentiles. This was a call to allegiance to Christ and to God. And I think we understand now why the Romans, the government of that time, was so against it. And I think we should understand today the reality of the call. When Jesus calls you and me, he calls us to stand with him no matter what the cost. No matter what our friends think, no matter what our family thinks, you know, it, it's a big thing. That's the cost. In every generation, in every country, you have a different cost. You know, I, I remember when we would uh, spread the gospel, you know, where I was in that unnamed place, <laughs> when people... For the first time, I had so many young students that would tell me, oh, you know, I'd love to believe Christ, but I can't. I'm like, why? How come? I, I can't because my parents would kill me. <laughs> that was like, 
the major reason why people didn't want to receive Christ. I, and I was like, how old are you? You're, you're like 25. You're like 21. Like, you're an ad- adult. <laughs> you know, I would like do that. You know, you're an adult. But no, it's like, no, that was a huge cost to them. My parents wouldn't approve. That was a big, big thing. Maybe there's some people like that in here too. And maybe, and some other people, it's like my friends, they'd laugh at me. They'd never like let me down. Like it, it would be whatever it is. Maybe there's even um, societal, other societal costs. But there's a cost and it's calling for this allegiance to the new king. And lastly, the gospel is about a powerful salvation. Okay. Um, so in Romans chapter 1, it says, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. Salvation. Okay, what does that mean? This means a present and future deliverance, preservation, safety, salvation, from the powers of sin, Satan, and the world. Um, salvation is not just being saved from hell. I think that needs to be clear. This is not just a ticket to heaven. Salvation is what? This is a powerful process. It's God's power that changes our lives. It's God's power at work in our lives today and in the future. Amen? How many of you need the power of God in your life? We all do. Now, this is what salvation looks like, okay? The gospel power of salvation. I know a lot of people, when they think of salvation, they think of going to heaven, but it's not just that. It's all these, election, What is election? God's choice of people to be saved. You know, the thing is, most people don't understand, and I didn't understand this for a long time, whether you're Arminian or Calvinist, everyone believes in election. Even Arminians, you know, those are free free will people. Even Arminians, they believe in the idea of election. Now, the reason you're elected, there's differences in terms of Arminianism and Calvinism, but everyone believes in election. The gospel call, God brought the message of salvation to you whether it's today or sometime in the past, that Jesus Christ, he died for you and he resurrected for you and his power is here for you today and he expects your allegiance to him. Number three, regeneration. Now this is what it means to be born again, a change of the heart, a desire for God in salvation, a heart change that happens within you. That's a mystery. We're not sure exactly how how it happened and and why and and whatnot, but it's something that changes in your heart. A conversion, this is a response to that change, your faith and your repentance. Justification, this is a one-time done, there's a one and done uh, legal standing before God. Adoption, uh, this is a one-time, we're members of God's family. Sanctification, this is ongoing. The right conduct in life. The Bible says we're changing from glory to glory. There is a a shift, a a maturation, a change. Now, this is not like a line, but it's usually like, you know, like this uh, for most of us. There's a change that's happening within us by the grace of God. Perseverance of remaining uh, in him till we die or till Christ comes. And there's a glorification, which is the receiving of the resurrection Uh, body. All of this is done by the power of God. All of this. We are in need of that power, and that's the gospel. The gospel, the good news is that he has power for us today. And so when we think about this new semester, right, you know, I don't know what class you got. (laughs) Probably some of them are pretty hard. When we think about our future, you know, and, we, and it's a blank. I don't know. You know, when you think about our major, is this the right major? I don't know. Should I change majors? Probably. <laughs> what to? Not sure. 
You know, when we, when we think about our future, it's a big question mark. In the midst of that, God has the power to guide us. God has the power to save us. God has the power to change us. God has the power to give us hope today. When we look at our relationships, and we feel like, oh, I don't know how. I'm not good at relationships. I'm not good at friendship. I'm not good at whatever uh, relationship that you're supposed to have or you think you should have. God is able. He has power to change us and to help us to grow. Amen? He does that. He does that. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. God can work in you and me. You know, from the wreck that we are at times, he can build us back up. That's the power of the gospel. Hallelujah, amen? From the wreck that we are. I have so many stories about wrecks. You know, from the wrecks, wreck that we are, and he can change us, build us up, give us more, and, and, and bring us into that new life. Does the gospel have the power to do this in our lives? The gospel gives us a new life, a new king, a powerful salvation, and the gospel life. It says in Colossians 1, 29, for this I toil, struggling with all his energy that powerfully works within me. That powerful, his energy that powerfully works within you and me. That's what Paul was testifying about. And he's saying that's what we are today. So let's not be like the world. Let's not... You know, there's like this laying fat, flat, quiet, quitting, anti-adulting. I don't, there's just like, there's a lot of words and a lot of things that the world says that discourages us from even trying. You know, it just tells us, forget it. You just be yourself. <laughs> Whatever that is. I don't think that's the goal. We need to be our best selves. Amen? What God created me for and how he wants me to be. And we need to grow into that best self that he has called us to. If you're not a Christian today, um, you know, and you sense the calling of God, and we're, we're talking about salvation, calling of God today, I want to encourage you to present yourself to God in prayer. Um, and as we, uh, the praise team comes forward, I would like to um, kind of come and present ourselves before God today. Okay, present ourselves before God. If we can, um, can we rise before uh, the Lord and, in a sense, present yourself? And we talked about presenting yourself as a, an allegiance and a, a loyalty, intimacy in relationship. And the Bible says, present yourselves to God. And God does not reject us because he calls us to come as we are. You know, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So no matter what sin we've committed, no matter how you felt bound, powerless in the past, today his gospel is calling us to live a life that's different and to grow in the power that God gives us and that he works within us. So, so let's present ourselves today before God.